So this, this talk is about synthesizing sound. When we're synthesizing sound, we're generating new sounds from simpler building blocks. So we might be trying to create a brand new sound that no one's heard before, or we might want to create an existing sound to, to, to sim synthesize a, a real instrument. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about several methods of synthesis that have been developed in the last, say, 100 years. And I'm going to show you some code that you can run today in your browser, as long as it supports a web audio API, which probably most of the browsers that you're using do. There's too much code to go into detail, and so what I've done is I've put all of the demos and all of the different types of synthesis that I'll be talking about on my GitHub repo, and that's where you can go and have a look and, at the code and play around with it and try and uh, make something fun. So I'm going to start in the early days of synthesis and the type of synthesis called monophonic synthesis. This gentleman is Leon Theremin, is a Russian uh, scientist and musician, and he developed, uh, in 1928, he patented the instrument that you can see him playing there, which is called after him, that called the theremin. Theremin was working for the Russian military on proximity sensors, and from that work, he just developed this instrument that you could play by moving your hands near some antenna. So this gentleman's playing one, two, busking a theremin, which I've never seen before. And you control the pitch with one hand and the volume with the other. And it can play a single note at a time. So you can play one note and change the frequency and the volume. In the Web Audio API, we build our instruments inside something that's called a context. And this is how you construct a context. And the context lets you ask questions about the audio environment in which you're building your, your uh, applications. So for example, how many channels does the audio hardware on my laptop have? It has two, left and right. What sample rate is it? What resolution of audio can I achieve? But the Web Audio API provides building blocks for you to construct at a fairly high level what you want the modifications of sound, what modifications you want to happen. And we do that by constructing graphs, audio processing graphs. So here's a graph which can represent, if you like, a theremin. So we have a source of sound, a single frequency, which is an oscillator, which generates a sine wave, a simple uh, single, single frequency sine wave. And we pass that into a volume control, which in web audio we call a gain node and that allows us to control the volume of that sine wave. And then we pass it to the output. And here's how we declare that graph of processing in code. So you can see it's, it's very declarative. So the context has a constructor on it, create oscillator, and another one for the volume control, create gain. And then we connect the oscillator to the volume control, and we connect the volume control to the destination. So that's the code that you'd write in the console. And this is what it sounds like. Oh no, surprised myself. If we want to modify something, for example, the frequency of the oscillator, we can control the parameters. And we can say, ramp the value of the parameter to 2,000 hertz in two seconds time. Now I think I've got the sound, hang on. There we go. Sound engineer's not killing me, that's good. <laughs> so, so this graph you'll see a little bit throughout my talk. So this is a plot of not, not the waveform over time, but actually the frequency content of the sound that you just heard. And um, so along the x-axis is the frequency, and along the y-axis is the energy. So you can see that all of the sound is concentrated in a single frequency. So that's why it's a monophonic synthesis. So if you want to change the volume of the sound, we can also automate that in the same way. So we can automate the gain parameter of the volume control, and we say, just decay away to zero over two seconds. So if we connect those two things together, those two parameter automations, and we kind of map it to the mouse pointer, then we can make something that sounds a bit like a theremin. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. That's like go up and 
Right, the next type of synthesis I want to talk about is additive synthesis. So remember with the theremin, we were just having a single frequency, an oscillator and a gain and an output. And the problem with that is that it's kind of a boring sound. So it only, uh, it only sounds, well, it sounds like this. So what if we wanted to synthesize a real instrument, for example, a, a brass instrument or a trumpet, which sounds more like this? Here in the plots of the frequencies, you can see there's much more, uh, there's many more, there's much more energy at a lot higher frequencies. There's a richer sound. It's more interesting. In the 1700s, the French mathematician Fourier, he proved that if you wanted to construct any conceivable sound, any sound that you could hear, you could do that actually by summing together individual single frequency components. And that's what we call additive synthesis. And it's used in things, for example, like the, the Hammond organ. Uh, if you've ever played a, a pipe organ or a Hammond organ, you can play notes, but there's also draw bars which let you control the amount of each of the frequencies that make up each of the individual notes. So you can kind of synthesize other sounds by combining single frequencies. In the Web Audio API, it's actually quite easy to do additive synthesis because things add together naturally when we connect them to, to other notes. So if we take what we had for the theremin, an oscillator and a gain, and just replicate that several times and connect it to the output, they will sum together. So that lets us add those frequencies together. And in code, that's really easy. We use the constructors again for the oscillator and the gain node. We connect the oscillators to the gains and the gains to the destination, but we just do that a number of times. So by doing that, we've created something that's a little bit richer sounding, more interesting, has, has more harmonic content. And so if you put that together into an instrument, we can create something that sounds a little bit like an organ. So each one of those notes contains several frequencies, and we can play several notes at the same time. And we can also change the frequencies that are in those notes to, to change the character of the sound. It's a little bit more reedy. The problem with that from, a, from the point of view of a musician is that it's really hard to work with. So if you want to create a sound, you have to think about all of those parameters. So how much of each one of those individual frequencies do I need? Uh, what's the relative volumes of them? What, what frequencies? How do they change over time? It's a lot of parameters to have to worry about. And so synthesizing in that way is, is quite difficult. So another form of synthesis that was developed was subtractive synthesis. In the background of this slide, you can see the Moog synthesizer, which was a kind of a, the classic sort of subtractive synth. And the principle there is we actually start with a sound that's already quite rich in harmonics and has a lot of frequency content in it. Uh, and for an example of that is a sawtooth wave. In the Web Audio API, we can say the type of the oscillator, and we say, well, give me a sawtooth wave instead of a sine wave. And a sawtooth wave sounds like this. So it already has a large amount of frequency content, and it's a more interesting sound. And then with subtractive synthesis, what we want to do is remove some of those components. So we want to filter it. And we can create a filter in Web Audio, and we say, let's have a low pass filter, which will filter everything out above a certain frequency. So we can remove some of that filtering. And now we only really have a single parameter to control, which is the, the cutoff frequency. So we could, for example, change the cutoff frequency very slowly over time using another oscillator that's more like a triangle, so it ramps up and ramps down. And so we can connect that to the frequency parameter of our filter and create something that sort of evolves and changes over time and sounds more interesting. So now we have a lot less parameters to worry about and it's, an, it's a kind of an easier way to think about it from a musical point of view in terms of creating real instrument sounds. Um, here's a little demo of, of that. I'm not much of a keyboard player. 
So the subtractive synthesis, the analog synthesizers, they let you connect um, processing elements together, and even sometimes with wires, uh, which allowed you to filter and, and change the sounds. And so that concept might sound a little bit familiar to you now because it's how the web audio API works. And actually, Bob Moog, the inventor of, of the synthesis, or the, I guess the pioneer of it, he was very influenced by the work that was happening at Bell Labs in the 19, late 50s, early 60s on computer music. So this was where the first computer programs were being developed to create music. And actually, the idea of connecting blocks together to process sound started in the computer world in the labs at Bell, and then was kind of influenced the analog synths. And music was a, a programming language that looked like this. I, I won't take you through it line by line. But you wrote these programs on punch cards, and you could wait several hours and generate music with them. But what this did do was it put it put synthesis in the hands of many people and it made it kind of accessible because you could do it on a computer rather than having to have a lot of electronic gear. And so it was used by a lot of different people. And one of the people who really pioneered a type of synthesis called frequency modulation synthesis was John Chowning at Stanford University. Uh, he was a musician, but he had some ideas of the sounds that he wanted to create and he used the computer programs to do that. And what he realized was if you connect one oscillator to another oscillator and let that oscillator modulate, so let the modulator modulate the carrier oscillator, that is change its frequency over time, you can create very, very rich sounds but with very simple components. So here we're gonna do that uh, with the Web Audio API. We connect the modulator to the frequency parameter of the carrier and just let it modulate it over time. And you can hear how that kind of starts brighter and then decays away. And we're only really playing there with, with a single parameter. In his paper, Chowning described how you could use this to synthesize brass sounds, which was something he was really interested in. They're traditionally very difficult to synthesize. He'd done very detailed studies of the kind of sounds that brass instruments made, and then he used FM synthesis to do it. So this demo has a little recreation of the sounds that he was able to make. <laughs> So it does sound a little bit brassy. You've heard the DX7 synthesizer, which is licensed by uh, Yamaha. They licensed the patent from Stanford. Things you never thought you'd hear at a JavaScript conference. <laughs> and the technology that he developed and, and that Stanford patented was also licensed by games console manufacturers to use in kind of the, the, the range of 16-bit consoles that came out, like the Sega Mega Drive. Name, name the soundtrack. Yes. <laughs> so for a long time, the FM synthesis patent of Stanford was their biggest grossing patent by far. I think it's brought in over $30 million to the university over time. It was a, a kind of a huge money earner for them. When people started using computers to do music and computers started getting more and more powerful, then uh, it became possible to to, um, to record and store audio in the computers themselves and manipulate real recordings of audio. And we call that sampling on sample, sampling synthesis. So you can imagine how by taking as your basis a recording of a real instrument and then changing it, you can create more realistic uh, uh, synthesis, synth, synth, synthesis of, of real instruments. In the Web Audio API, it's quite easy to do sampling. So the first thing that we do is we make a a request for an audio file that we're storing on a server somewhere at the URL. And then we pass the, re the return of that response to uh, a method called decode audio data. 
and that will strip all of the, the raw data of that audio file out of the container. So if it's an MP3 file, it will kind of decode it and give you back the raw, the raw bytes for you to work with. And when you've done that, you can create a source from that. So you can load those bytes into a source. And then you can do things like loop them, play them back when you want, uh, reverse them, play them more slowly, that kind of thing. This is one of the most famous samples in musical history. So that four-bar drum loop from uh, Amen Brother by the Winstons is kind of the most sampled loop of all time. And it's used as the basis of kind of lots and lots of hip-hop music, electronic music of all kinds, really. Um, and famously this. You are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. I've been listening to that quite a lot. So what those producers were doing was taking that break, sampling it, and then chopping it up into pieces and assigning it to keys and then reassembling it to make their own drum loops and that kind of thing. So we can do something similar. <laughs> To, to, fi to finish up, I wanted to talk about some of the possibilities that open up with computers and synthesis when you give some of the control that you have over the choices you make as a musician, kind of give them to the computer. And so an interesting form of synthesis that uses this is something called granular synthesis. And the principle of granular synthesis is that you take a recording of, of some sound and you chop it up into, into tiny, tiny pieces, typically 50 milliseconds long, and you call those grains. If you just naively chop up the sound, it will kind of click, and that's not always what you want. So you tend to provide a smooth kind of window over that grain so that it can blend in with others. When we've got the raw audio data in the web audio API, kind of manipulating the samples in that way is, is quite straightforward. Um, I won't go into this, but this is taking the data from a small amount and applying a smooth window over it. And in granular synthesis, you, you don't, talk, you don't tell the computer exactly when to play each of these grains, rather you provide um, some parameters in which the algorithm can operate and then it chooses it. And granular synthesis people, they talk about clouds of grains that have density and high stratus clouds and this kind of thing. Um, so it's a very interesting kind of sort of concept of, of, of making music that, that operates with different language to what we're used to. So I've taken a sample of this sort of synthesizer sound. And I've chopped it up into thousands of grains. And then I just let the computer randomly walk between them and decide what it wants to play next. change the amount and the density and the length of those grains, you get quite a different texture to that sound. This is, this is Max Matthews, who uh, was the developer of the music programming language at Bell Labs that we talked about a little bit earlier on. Um, he was giving a presentation shortly before he died in 2011. He called the computer the universal instrument. And what he meant by that was that using the principles of synthesis that we've seen today, um, you could use a computer to create any conceivable sound. But he said the challenge that we face isn't a computing one, it's it's a philosophical one. It's trying to understand why music is beautiful and what we love about it. The Web Audio API has put the universal instrument in front of every one of you, has 
your laptop with you. And I hope that by reading the code and listening to my talk today, it's inspired you to make something that sounds beautiful. Thank you.